Welcome to Sunday Stories, I'm Michael Sanford. Over the next hour, we'll be sharing stories that celebrate the rich history, amazing people, and fascinating places throughout our region and beyond. Community colleges are an affordable option for those seeking to obtain a college education. Most people are familiar with the associate degrees and professional certificate programs that are available, but you may not know there are select four-year degree programs being offered at some community colleges. Our lead story takes us to Feather River College in Quincy, where a bachelor's degree program is training future cowgirls, cowboys, and ranchers. When the law was finally passed that allowed community colleges to have bachelor's degrees, the rule was we could not duplicate any program that a California State University offered. Fifteen colleges were allowed to offer a bachelor's degree, and we submitted the Bachelor of Equine and Ranch Management as a proposal to the state. We had to start the curriculum from zero. We didn't have any curriculum for a four-year degree. So what we did is we just said, well, let's take a job description of what we would like our students to be able to do. Okay. You had to know something about cattle, and you had to know something about horses. The way the program was designed, the total cost would be under $10,000. That includes all four years. That's not per year, that's for all four years. I am getting, in my opinion, a better education, more up my alley, like with a lot more things that I'm interested in for a small, small fraction of the cost. The specialized bachelor's degree offered at Feather River College, later on Sunday Stories. The Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito cares for about 600 distressed marine mammals every year, rescuing and rehabilitating them. We'll join Rob Stewart as he visits the center to see the work being done. Each of these animals has been rescued? Yeah, each one of these animals has been ill or injured for some reason along the 600 miles of coastline that we respond to. So we send out our volunteers, we rescue them, we bring them up here to Sausalito, we provide them the best veterinary care that they can get, we collect samples, um, we provide, we do research and, and try to better understand what's wrong with them, the diseases they have, and really the problems that are causing them to come here. So we're open almost every day of the year from 10 to 5, and anyone can come here, it's free to um, all visitors, and they can come here and, and watch us taking care of the animals. More of Rob's visit to the Marine Mammal Center later on Sunday Stories. We'll head to El Dorado for a stop at Poor Red's Barbecue and meet the trio of entrepreneurs who brought the historic tavern, famous for its golden Cadillac cocktail and barbecue, back to life. Brothers Mike and Jeff Genovese and restaurateur Mike Countullis are the trio behind resurrecting Poor Red's a popular local watering hole rich with history dating back to gold rush days. My brother and my objective from day one though was if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right and we're going to fix this place for the next 50 years. If we didn't do it, it wouldn't get done and it would just sit in disrepair and never reopen. But it had so much history. People just have special feelings for it and they always have. There is something to be said for these old gems in these hidden counties that are going by the wayside. Well, we're all definitely pleased with the new yes. Poor Red's. The history and restoration of Poor Red's Barbecue, ahead on Sunday Stories. In January 2019, Tony Thurman took the reins as California's new state superintendent of public instruction. His strong belief in the value and importance of education fueled his drive and success. We'll spend some time with and get to know the superintendent. When I think about how education impacted me, you know, I had great teachers who always believed in me and, and they really imparted a message that if I believed in education that my life would be better than it started. I'm, I'm confident that it meant the difference uh, for me between ending up in California State Prison and instead ending up as California State Superintendent. What makes him well suited for this position is that he has a lived experience that's unique and unlike any other superintendent. I mean, he's Afro-Panamanian. He's lived an experience in which he was orphaned and he had to uh, be raised by, you know, his cousin that he had never met. And so education um, to him is very personal. California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, 
later on Sunday Stories. A greeting card business that's filled the need and taken off. Violinist Regina Carter's story in her own words. A conversation with Antiques Roadshow glass appraiser, Arlie Sulga. It's known to some as the Horse College, Feather River College's unique four-year degree program in equine and ranch management provides students with hands-on experience working with horses and livestock while learning management and business principles. We're in beautiful Quincy, California. It's in Plumas County. It's northeastern California. Feather River College has been here since 1968. Just celebrated our 50th anniversary at Feather River College. We have a very strong reputation as the, as the horse college. We joke and say it's the, you ever seen a horse that's been to college? <laughs> when the law was finally passed, that allowed community colleges to have bachelor's degrees. The rule was we could not duplicate any program that a California State University offered. Fifteen colleges were allowed to offer a bachelor's degree, and we submitted the Bachelor of Equine and Ranch Management as a proposal to the state. We had to start the curriculum from zero. We didn't have any curriculum for a four-year degree. So what we did is we just said, well, let's take a job description of what we would like our students to be able to do. You had to know something about cattle, and you had to know something about horses. I originally wanted to go to Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, but they didn't have really any majors that I was interested in. And after doing research and FRC kept popping up, and I clicked on it, they had a big flyer announcing that they were awarded the ability to offer their new bachelor degree program starting in 2016, which is when I was heading off to college. So I came and checked out the college and looked at the town and everything fell into place from there. So today we'll uh, go ahead and we'll process the calves that we have. We have 25 calves to process. My name is J.P. Tanner. I am the beef professor for Feather River College. Okay. Any questions? Now that we're, we're dialing in on careers, um, once they get to their junior and senior year, we want to make sure that they are dialed into their area that they want to have a career in long term. So like at those points, as I'm just getting all this into all here, I don't have to worry. It's changed the way I teach as an instructor, because now I need to be more in depth in, in my courses. They have classes on packing. They have classes like working with cows and they have classes where you're riding and that was all very new to me. In the last year, I jumped more to the cow side of things. The skin are the same. Horses will always be in my life, but they will be in my life as a hobby. And I'm very interested in cows and the production and maintenance and management of cattle. And honestly, I love anything with cows. <laughs> we could just bring these three. Yeah, I want to become a ranch manager, but after school, I'm going to go start working on a ranch and working my way up. I'm from Bend, Oregon. Uh, I was born on a farm and I came here to play baseball and then I was just planning on doing the two year associate's degree. And then I finally realized that they're offering a four year program in ranch management and that's something I want to do. So decided that that's what I want to do. The biggest question that, that, that's probably asked me by parents, by students when they come here is, okay, what can my son or daughter do if they go here? And what, what can they do if they are here for two years and what can they do for four years? And of course, my standard response back to that, well, that's upon the student. We had a graduate last year who got hired up by Ted Turner's ranch in Montana. He's the largest landowner in Montana and has one of the largest ranches in the United States, so he's a manager up there. We've had students open up horse therapy programs. One has a riding program for severe mental or brain injuries. Uh, there's other ones that have been doing agricultural lending. We've had people work with beef cattle. We actually have graduates that are doing training programs for horses, how to train horses as well. Throughout the country, many community colleges have begun to offer bachelor's degrees, so this is something new for California. So these 15 programs were created to not only test to see how it would work in California, but also to give us the opportunity to expand our reach, to help 
communities, to help regions satisfy the demand for technical expertise. And hopefully we will begin expanding beyond those 15 in the near future. Yes, huh, kids. Huh, kids. Huh. Well, I'm from Brentwood, California. I've never been a big city person, and I've always loved the mountains, and it just was the combination of horses and mountains, and it was just felt right to me. My two siblings before me, they spent a lot of money in college, and the lower cost is great help, especially when you're trying to do other things and balance being a student. I don't think everyone can afford to pay thousands of dollars per year to go to college, and it's something that I wanted to do and it's something that's important is to get a degree, but it's not affordable for everyone. And this is so important because I can get my four year degree, but at a price that is, is not gonna cost me a lot in the future, but it's just so beneficial. The way the program was designed, the total cost would be under $10,000. That includes all four years. That's not per year, that's for all four years. I am getting, in my opinion, a better education, more up my alley, like with a lot more things that I'm interested in for a small, small fraction of the cost. Um, and plus, I'm getting more one-on-one -on -one time with each of the instructors. That's a huge difference from having a class filled with 50 kids to 10. So we are able to um, advance our skills a lot better, a lot faster, and get more one-on-one -on -one time. And in my opinion, I'm getting a better education than I could have gotten anywhere else. I get to do stuff that I never thought I'd be able to do. Work with mares, breed horses, halt or break, you know, babies. Just all kinds of stuff that I never thought I'd be able to do, but this has given me that opportunity and I'm just so thankful for it. Later, a look at the work being done at the Marine Mammal Center. But first, an entrepreneurial success story. When Gregory Perkins opened his small shop in Sacramento in 1991, he was filling a need that wasn't being met by the major greeting card companies. African American Expressions has since grown to be a multi-million dollar operation that's expanded to include over 700 products that, as Gregory says, beautify the African American experience. So I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York, born and raised, and uh, it was uh, about 19 years old. My brother was out in California. My dad asked me if I would like to come out and visit them for, for you know, Christmas. So I came out for Christmas with a plan. It was a two-way ticket, but I only used one, one part of it. <laughs> I just felt that I was created for more. So I came out with $300 in my pocket, just looking for opportunity. Didn't know where they would take me, but I was determined to make it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we've done quite well. Well, today, after um, 28 years in business, um, we have become the largest in the world at what we actually do. I like to think that anything that you see in a Hallmark store, we're the black hallmark now. We create Christmas cards, calendars, planners, figurines. We beautify the African-American experience. How can you not love that? Especially if you're African-American. We felt that Hallmark was missing the point. The African-American community cars that didn't look like us. They were actually Caucasian images, painted brown, and they were serving to the African-American community. And we said, no, we, that's not us. We feel that we could do that better. We could do imagery of ourselves in the way we speak for us, by us. And so that was what fueled me to move this thing forward. This is actually one of our first cards we ever printed. And it just brings me back to remember how starting in my home, working out in my garage, I actually get a little emotional when I look at this. Reminds me of the, the 28 years of hard work. It just brings joy to my soul. Never have I thought it would be as big as it is today. Today, we're housed in a 42,000 square foot facility. We have over 700 products now. And so we manufacture those offshore, we bring them in, and we sell them to stores all around the world. Okay. 
It's really cool because we can think it, we can create it, design it, send it to our partners in China, and we can have a product within a week at our doorstep. I attribute 100% uh, of what I do in business to my faith. And so we were involved in the homeless ministry downtown where we, we leased out an 8,000 square foot facility to feed the homeless. And uh, out of that, we, we said, let's do something a little more. I had a project that I needed done and uh, I said, why don't we hire? So we hired eight homeless people. Out of that, hiring eight people, we have one that's stuck. He's not only working, but he's the lead guy in the warehouse. Oh, it changed my life. And like Greg always told me, you're not homeless, you're just in transition. So that transition from homeless to getting a job, getting married, and buying a house, as, and I'm here now, I'm a changed man. It impacted me so much. Stuffed him. So that's what's gonna go to Essence, right? Essence. Okay, good. To see myself in this position now, I couldn't even think about it. We're gonna wrap this up. Let's get out. Let's and get then out. we can schedule that. We're still on time, right? Schedule. Yes, we wise? are. Okay. We are on schedule. It's all about taking a team, empowering your team, and letting them do what they do best. So definitely going out today. Definitely going out today. Greg has that insight to see through people. He sees what's inside you, and he will do everything to bring that out in you. Mm, let's get it done. And then we're done. Beautiful. The impact that he has on people through his cards and everything, it's, I've never seen it before. Never. His heart is filled with love. Really proud of you, man. But I'm proud of you <laughs> for sticking with me. I love God and I love people. And uh, I like to think that God created me to do what I do. I believe it's my calling. We put smiles on people's faces. Okay, that's what we do. We spread joy, we spread, we spread the love through gifts. Dr. Sean Johnson is the Director of Veterinary Medicine here at the Marine Mammal Center. Good to see you. Nice to meet you, Rob, and really appreciate you coming by and visiting the Marine Mammal Center. I'm so glad to be here. What a pleasure to showcase the science that happens here. We are surrounded by hundreds of California sea lions and elephant seals right in this area. It's just an incredible place that we have here where we can join the, the rehabilitation, the science, and the education, and the outreach here all at the Marine Mammal Center. Each of these animals has been rescued? Yeah, each one of these animals has been ill or injured for some reason along the 600 miles of coastline that we respond to. So we send out our volunteers, we rescue them, we bring them up here to Sausalito, we provide them the best veterinary care that they can get, we collect samples, uh, we provide, we do research and, and try to better understand what's wrong with them, the diseases they have, and really the problems that are causing them to come here. So most of them are, are been separated from their mother, or they're malnourished, or they have infections. Um, some of them have cancer, some of them have been exposed to biotoxins that cause seizures. So right here we have a group of sea lions and this, the volunteers are trying to identify a specific animal to, to probably give them their medication for the day. And you can see they all look very similar, but they all have flipper tags on and some of them have grease markers on their head. You mentioned cancer, you mentioned seizures. A lot of these illnesses are illnesses that we as humans face. Is that where the research component comes in? Yes, I'm, um, besides doing marine mammal rehab here, we have a really strong research department where we're trying to better understand the diseases these animals have because some of them, as you say, are directly linked to human health. It's uh, really great that we have the resources and the interest to, you know, the volunteers to, to provide the health that these animals need, but also to learn more about the individual animals, the populations of animals, and the ocean that they live in. We 
sitting here in a national park, down to the beach, over to the Golden Gate Bridge, nestled here in this valley is this, this magical place that's all about taking care of these animals. The facility and its location is, is just perfect. We're on a part of the California coast that is just idyllic. We're adjacent to waters that are just so rich in marine life. And what we have is this amazing opportunity by virtue of the patients that we see to get a window into, into this miraculous body of water, the Pacific Ocean, and to help us all understand what it takes to steward that towards um, a great and healthy future. People all rely on the ocean, even indirectly, even if you live in the middle of the country. The ocean can, has so much influence on our food, on our weather, and, and these are the sentinels of the sea, the animals that live in the ocean, the top predators. A lot of the animals that we have here are here because the ocean temperatures are so warm right now. This ocean temperature warming has caused the fish stocks to, to move away or to decrease and along with some of the overfishing that we're seeing right now. And it's a real wake-up call for all of us, I think. I mean, they're telling us that we should really take, pay attention to what's going on in the ocean right now. So, Car, you can keep working while we jump in here, but this little fella's a month old? Yes, he's about a month, uh, probably or so, based on his teeth. They're just, they've just recently erupted, so they're still quite small. And you put so, him to sleep. Yep, he's under anesthesia. And this is the same anesthesia that was developed in humans for infants originally. So it's a very safe, it's, uh, it's still used commonly in both veterinary and, and human hospitals today. His little flipper yeah. has to hurt. Most definitely. So this is a really swollen little flipper that we're dealing with here. He had a very large abscess here. What we had to do is make an incision here to allow some of that fluid and that pus to drain out. So he's on good, strong antibiotics and pain meds, but the best we can do is get this all flushed out to uh, promote his healing. What is the ultimate goal, the end result for this um, little fellow? Ideally, if this infection will clear up, he should be able to have full use of this flipper. Right now it's a little compromised because it's definitely very inflamed and, and painful. Um, but he does still use it, he does still move it around, but we want to make sure that there's no bony infection that develops. They've got a lot of bones in here, in fact their flipper is very much like our hand. Mm. Um, so there's all those little fine bones in there, so if those get infected, then he would have to lose the flipper potentially if we can't cure it with antibiotics. Will you release him back into the wild? Yes, we think if we can get this cleared up that he would be able to be released. What do we have going on here? Well, this is another group of elephant seals. They've been fed today, so some of them are lounging around in the sunshine. <laughs> a few of them are playing here in the water. Um, you know, elephant seals sleep a lot yeah, out in the wild or here, and, and they even sleep underwater sometimes. Really? The, the guests here can see the animals, and they'll be like, oh my god, that animal's drowning. But they will often will be at the bottom of the pool for 20, 30 minutes just taking a really? nap. Yep not moving at all and their whole and then they'll wake up come up take a breath and then go back down and it's always that's what it's always exciting when uh for the guests that are here to see these animals and they think they're dead and you mentioned the guest up here you can see where people get to walk around and look over all of the pens here open year round except for three days a year yes we're open almost every day of the year from 10 to 5 and anyone can come here it's free to um, all visitors and they can come here and, and watch us taking care of the animals but we also have a interpretive center and education um, center so it's a great experience to come here and learn about marine mammals the ocean they live in and uh, just to see all the hard work that we do and learn about the science that's ongoing here. So I keep hearing all of the awesome noises. I know, these elephant seals make the most incredible noises. And you know, they're so unique that they've actually been recorded and used in a, a variety of different movies, mostly um, cool movies like really? Jurassic Park, Lord of the Rings. You know, you, if you listen to those movies, you'll hear these strange noises. And when you come here and you're like, oh, I recognize that. How yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. So we get, uh, we get movie, movie producers and sound people come in here and record these crazy noises all the time. What do we have going on over here? Um, we have some elephant seal pups. These guys ended up on the beaches somewhere. Um, they were weaned by their mom. They weren't able to figure out how to survive on their own. They, they lost too much weight um, to really 
to make it. So they, we pick them up, bring them in here, do full physical exams on them, do veterinary exams, make sure they're not sick. And then the volunteers start to provide them with the nutrients they need, to, a, a herring milkshake or some, some whole herring in here. A herring milkshake? A herring milkshake. We take some herring, grind it up. Have you ever tried one of those? Um, no. Okay. No. Uh, all right, but, but you're, you're um, welcome to try some later. No, I'll, I'll pass. You also teach many of these animals how to eat fish because they've never seen it. They were rescued. Yeah, a lot of them are so young that they've never been out in the wild and they don't really know what a live fish looks like when it's chasing around. So we have to do what we call fish school and we'll take a, a fish and pull it through the water to simulate a, a live fish in the water mm -hmm. and to get them stimulated to try to catch the fish and so that we we don't want to release them until we know that they understand that they have to chase the fish down and grab it in their mouth and swallow it. And so our volunteers come out here with fish and we'll stimulate them and train them how to catch a live fish. Fish oh, school. Cool. Fish school, yeah. Some of them are free feeding and some of them haven't started eating consistently on their own yet. The volunteers are, are trying to separate the ones that are more aggressively eating from the ones that are having a hard time so they can give them more time to, to, to learn how to eat and start eating on their own. We need to weigh every animal at least once a week so we can make sure they're eating. Um, it's really crucial that we, we get their weights when they come in, when they leave. So before we can release an animal, we want them to be a certain size and this is based on the experience from the past. These elephant seals behind us, it amazes me that these will become the full grown elephant seals like we've seen when we took the show to Año Nuevo State Park. They are huge. Exactly, the, the males can get up to 5,000 pounds. Thousand, but, uh, yeah. Elephant seal pup on its birthday is 85 pounds or so. And within three to four weeks, it will gain weight to be 250 pounds. And then mom's investment in that pup is done. She leaves the beach and they're on their own. This group that comes into our care, they're underweight, they're malnourished. And then our job is to be a surrogate mom, to get them the nutrition they need, to get them up into a robust body condition and mature enough to be able to then leave our facility, get back out into the Pacific Ocean and fend for themselves. These animals are set for release? Yeah, so we have some sea lions here. They've been here a few weeks, and you can see they've gained some weight, and they look happy and healthy. Boy, they do. Yeah, they do. They look good. And um, compared to when they first come in, they've more than doubled their weight since they've been here. These animals are getting exams and will probably be released here in, uh, today, I believe. <laughs> oh, they are ready to go. Yeah, they are. It They're works. I, I know. It's so much fun to see them at this stage when we're ready to take them back down to the beach. Raya, you've been volunteering for 11 years with yes, the Marine I have. Mammal Center. Absolutely. Today is the day. Right. For these guys, this is their trip home. What are we going to see? So we are going to see five harbor seals, four sea lions, and three elephant seals. You have driven about an hour and a half down from Sausalito here to Chimney Rock at Point Reyes National Seashore for the reunion day. Yes. Just look where they're going. I mean, we are set up for them to go home. Right, and this is a wonderful beach for them because it's gated and the animals get to rest here and the public does not come down onto the beach. And right now it's molting time and many of them look a bit scruffy, but they're, this is a natural process. They spend about a month here molting. And so you see a lot of females and juveniles and some of the juveniles are so, full of energy, they go out and they play fight. And they're learning to fight, so when they get to be really big boys, they're gonna have to fight for females during the breeding season. So this is practice. And it's fun too, but it's also a learning experience because they're building up skills that they're gonna need when the time comes when they have the big noses and they're a beach master. Well, one of the things that we've been building up for months is today and the time has come for the reunion with the Absolutely. wild. So let's, Absolutely. Shall let's we do, do it? it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Hi, baby. Let's go back home.
All right. So we're going to do one, two, three, and then we're going to press, OK? One, two, three. Go. Oh. Bye-bye. Yours is just a little scared. It's OK. Convince them they're going the other way. That's all they have to do. All right, round three. Ready? One, two, three, go. I love it because I hope that the older ones will teach the youngsters and show them the ropes. Raya, what did you think? Went beautifully. You know. Everybody just took off on their own. We didn't have to board them. They're happy. It was so sweet. Yes, absolutely. Watching them go out to the ocean. Mine was a little timid. Yours was timid, but you know, they're ba they're coming in as such young babies. They, they don't have much experience with beaches. And so he was a little bit intimidated, but he did it on his own. See, he just had to look around. A smart animal should look around because he doesn't know who else is on the beach. Mm -hmm. He's checking out his environment, making sure it's safe for him to proceed. That is such a special feeling to see these animals going home. Absolutely, absolutely. And to think of when, what they looked like when they came in. So helpless. And now look at them. Back to the wild. Absolutely. They're on their own. We don't know what they're going to do from now on, but they've had this marvelous second chance. Thank you for giving it to them. Absolutely. I love it. I do too. Later, California State Superintendent Tony Thurman's story. After closing its doors in 2014, Poor Reds was resurrected in 2016. Following an expansion and upgrades, it still manages to retain the same vibe it's been known for for decades. <laughs> My brother and my objective from day one, though, was if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right, and we're going to fix this place for the next 50 years. If we didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. And it would just sit in disrepair and never reopen. But it had so much history. People just have special feelings for it, and they always have. Brothers Mike and Jeff Genovese and restaurateur Mike Countullis are the trio behind resurrecting Poor Reds, a popular local watering hole rich with history dating back to gold rush days. However, the beloved tavern almost met its demise when its doors were suddenly shut in 2013. We pulled in and a guy next door, old guy, crusty, big white beard goes, it's closed. Poor Reds shut down after its previous owners experienced serious legal problems. I was in foreclosure, found out that it was for sale basically, and it had almost 40 liens on the property. Nobody wanted to touch it. It was a nightmare and a quagmire. I said, okay, if we can buy it, we need a guy, an expert to run it, and we found him. Do you have any special today? Yeah, we're gonna do the sausage sandwich today. Mike grew up in a family of successful restaurateurs and already had experience reviving the Purple Place, another historic local tavern. But convincing him wasn't easy. There's no way we could have reincarnated poor Reds without him. Time and time again, he's going, you don't understand what a stupid idea this is. It didn't pencil out. You know, for an 1850s building with some add-ons that had to be all torn down and rebuilt, it's tough to make it in this industry. So we kind of went round and round. I think there were some choice words. and He called my manhood into question and said, let's just do it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he's, they're great partners that way. Despite the odds, the three of them were able to return poor Reds to its former glory. 
It's a living piece of Gold Rush history. Poor Reds has always been a gathering spot in the small town of El Dorado. The iconic stone building was built in 1856 as a Wells Fargo way station. In 1927, it became a local bar named Kelly's. 18 years later, a man known as Poor Red won the bar in a game of dice. He and his wife, known as Rich Opal, ran it through the 1960s. Even before they reopened Poor Reds in 2016, Mike and Jeff promised to retain the charm and character of the place. So we knew if we could get it back on its feet the right way, keep the historical aspect like we did, mix in the new that we needed to do, that it could work. Let's put it this way, there was more to it than I thought. We use local contractors for the whole job, and that's what also made the place special because all those folks knew the place, mm -hmm. and they put love and care into redoing the place as well. So a lot of credit all the way around there. We figured out a few things like the extra dining room that we have over here. Then the patio, tear down the barn and put a patio in. That was another thing we needed to do. One of the things that we agreed upon early on was that we're gonna have good food. Mike found Dean Hyatt, our chef, and he's done a great job in the kitchen and the food here is spectacular. You got it? Blending the old and the new proved to be a winning combination. Of course, preserving the tavern's history meant keeping the legendary drink that put poor reds on the map, the Gold Cadillac, a blend of Galliano, creme de cacao, cream, and ice. This is like cheers on steroids. There you go. That's, that's it in a nutshell. People just have special feelings for it, and they always have. People like Marlene Edwards, who's been coming to Poor Reds since she was 25. Today, she's here to celebrate her 85th birthday. But it's just a great place to come, get together with friends. It's just, it's just a fun place to go. So these are our dollar points for Poor Reds tradition. The nice thing about the bar is you'll walk into the bar any time of the day, you'll see a guy like me sitting there next to a guy in a suit and tie, next to a guy in t-shirts and flip-flops. It could be anybody in here, and they're all talking to one another. That's the great thing about the bar, the high-low bar, is people talk across the bar to one another. Whose bachelor party is it? It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other place in this area like that. No, no other bar around. Do you know any other place around yeah. like that? Well, we're all definitely pleased with the new yes. Yes. This was a kind of a crazy thing to do. You know, th this has been a lot of fun. There is something to be said for these old gems in these hidden counties that are going by the wayside. It's been a blast. I, I love coming here. I love being part of it. And what I like most about it is people that come up to me and talk about the place are very appreciative of what we've done. And that makes me feel really good about where we're at with this. When I think about how education impacted me, you know, I had great teachers who always believed in me and, and they really imparted a message that if I believed in education that my life would be better than it started. I'm, I'm confident that it meant the difference uh, for me between ending up in California State Prison and instead ending up as California State Superintendent. Tony Thurman is California's newest superintendent of public instruction, guiding education policy for the state's six million students. He was inaugurated in January 2019 in front of a crowd at Sacramento's McClatchy High School. To which our children are entitled. I will not back down. I will not back down. California is immensely lucky to have a talented, committed, and savvy leader like Tony Thurman leading the Department of Education and fighting for our youth. Welcome to Sacramento. Welcome to everybody. Welcome, Superintendent. But it wasn't an easy road to the office. 
Thurmond was in a contested and expensive race for the position against charter school executive Marshall Tuck, with the results too close to call for days after the election. My campaign for state superintendent was certainly the toughest race that I've had in politics, and I've always had tough races, um, but I never lost faith. I always believed that if you put forward what your vision is for helping young people, that everything will work out the way it's supposed to. What's makes him well suited for this position is that he has a lived experience that's unique and unlike any other superintendent. I mean, he's Afro-Panamanian. He's lived an experience in which he was orphaned and he had to uh, be raised by, you know, his cousin that he had never met. And so education um, to him is very personal. My cousin raised me and she kept me out of the streets and she kept me out of trouble and she always made sure that we had the best education that we could possibly get. My mom was real sick and my mom had cancer and when I was six years old my mom lost her battle to cancer and my dad was not in the picture so I ended up growing up in Philadelphia. Thurman graduated from Temple University in Philadelphia before returning to the Bay Area where he became a social worker. That led to seats on the Richmond City Council and school board, then the state assembly and finally state superintendent. I've been very fortunate um, to be in a position to work with young people, to help them get a second chance, to help them get strong after school programs and mentoring programs. It's my mission um, to serve young people. Today, Thurman is meeting with students at Valley High School in Sacramento, involved with a program called Improve Your Tomorrow. Uh, so I showed up for the food, and, but then I started to really understand the mission of the program, and that was to get young men of color to and through college. Over the next four years, Thurman says he wants to focus on those students who are often too easily overlooked. He also wants to reform school budgets at a time when school districts like Sacramento are facing a budget crisis and teachers are striking in cities across the state. California still is 41st in the nation in per pupil spending, even though California is the fifth wealthiest economy in the world. Uh, we have to change that. And we always say that, that kids are our future. We have to act like it. And my top priority is imp increasing revenue for our schools, closing our achievement gap, closing our teacher shortage. Uh, how do you learn when you don't have a well-trained and qualified teacher at the head of every class? These reforms are more than Thurman's political platform. They're also personal. He has two daughters attending public schools. There are times when uh, I felt like if, if a teacher or a staff person is going to be so difficult to me, um, how are they going to treat other parents who don't know how to advocate for their children? And so we've got to work through the bureaucracy and the barriers that impact our educational systems. He's not a figurehead. He's actually boots on the ground and he's rolling up his sleeves and he knows what's happening at the department and he wants to be helpful personally. At the end of his term, Thurman says he hopes to increase the state's per pupil spending, putting the state on a trajectory to someday be the first in the nation. I think there's so much more that we can do in this state and I'm excited that the voters have given me the opportunity to do it. Still ahead, Antiques Roadshow appraiser Arlie Sulka shares the story of her $100,000 Holy Grail find. But first, world-renowned violinist Regina Carter shares her story, her love of the violin, and how family history and culture shapes her music. Before any stage I go on to, I know that I'm very blessed to be doing what it is that I do. Music and education were always really important in my household. My mom felt it was important for all of us, my brothers and I, to play music and go to the art museum and just be exposed to as much art as we could. And so when I was two, my brothers were six and eight years older than I am. They were taking piano lessons already at the house, and one day I walked up to the piano and started playing one of the pieces my brother had been practicing. And they were all shocked, and the teacher said, who taught her this piece? And they said, no one. We didn't even know she could play. 
And um, then this piano teacher tested me and found out I had a gift for being able to hear and repeat music. So I started piano lessons with a woman in a love in Detroit. And she had a book for me to read the music and I would always come in, not with those pieces learned, but with the pieces I had composed. So she didn't want to uh, stifle that creativity. So she told my mother to let me continue to create at home until I was older. I always remember my poor father because he didn't have a musical bone in his body and we'd sit at the piano and he'd by accident play a chord that like excited me and then I'd be like play that again and he had no clue what he had done his hands just acted and I would get so mad at him because he couldn't in my mind you know what you just played <laughs> and then when I was four the Suzuki method was offered for strings for the first time in Detroit and that's a method where they teach young children to play the same way we learn to speak at home by imitation. And I loved, I just fell in love with the violin. It's just something I loved to do growing up in the 60s. Music was just a part of everyone's life at home. It wasn't about trying to be a, a professional musician. It was just you sang, you played. It was a way for our families and communities to come together. I've always been curious about my ancestors from childhood. You know, I see certain programs on history channels or public television, and to see what they would go through as they were becoming an adult, maybe some of the, um, their, their, their clothing that they would wear, their jewelry, just all the dances, the music. And I felt like there was such a huge community and I wanted that as an African American, or I wanted to know what was that. So. After receiving the MacArthur um, Award, then that gave me the time and the money and the space to take some time off and to really start to delve in and do some research into my background. I'm like a kid in a candy shop. I love all kinds of music from all over the planet. And I think a lot of that has to do with growing up in Detroit and because there were so many cultures. One thing I always notice is that strings, violins, or something that violin is related to seem to always be present in all of these different musics from around the world. And just to hear how they were played in a very different way than the Western violin. But my ear always picked up on that and I always thought it was beautiful. So since my very first record on Atlantic, every record has kind of been different and all over the map. And People are used to that now, thank goodness. They know that I'm not just running after something, but I'm, I love all the different flavors. So I just wanted to share this beautiful, this, these beautiful sounds that I found at the same time, trying to find out more about myself and my ancestry. And what I think the most interesting thing, when we play concerts, sometimes afterwards, people will say to me, oh, you know, I, I found out my grandfather also was a coal miner in this area and then they'll ask me did you know about this information or did you read this article or I'll give them a name of a book to read or they'll give me so we're, we're sharing information and it gets people really interested in going back and checking out their ancestry and their family and then for others it brings up memories that maybe they had forgotten. I think that's really important for us to know from where we come because I really don't believe you can go forward unless you know that. Some people disagree with me. But I think also when people start to dig into their backgrounds, they see how much all of us really have had similar experiences and how much we are connected, whether we want to be or not. I'm flattered by that when people say that, but that's not why I do what I do. My personal success is something people don't even know about because it's being able to practice at home and get something that I've been working on for so long and I finally got it. Or going into a classroom full of young children and exposing them maybe to, you know, jazz violin for the first time. Seeing their faces beam and light up, that's my success. You know, I try not to say, oh, I'm playing in this big theater or I'm playing in this club. It doesn't matter because people are coming out to share the music, share the experience. So I'm always thankful for that. But it is nice and prestigious to know, wow, I'm playing in this hall, the Mondavi Center, or I'm playing Carnegie Hall, or I'm playing um, a hall in, in wherever. Even if it's just for myself, I feel like I want to continue that journey and 
continue to explore the music that comes out of that as well. Whether I put it out or it's just for myself, that's, that's another question. It just puts everything in perspective. And that's why then, no matter how crazy of a day I've had, when it's time to step on stage, maybe I've had three hours of sleep, maybe it's been like 27 flights in 21 days, or maybe, you know, who knows, I didn't eat, but I'm blessed to be able to play music. And, you know, as my granddad would say, beats a stick in the eye, so. <laughs> Sulk, uh, a praiser with Antique Trojo Show and have been for more than 20 years. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And welcome to Sacramento. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. This is my first time. Oh, nice. So there are a lot of people in Sacramento with wonderful items. Are you expecting anything in this region? I'm always a little nervous about glass because when you come to this part of the country because I worry that people are a little more reluctant to retain it or to collect it because there are, have been some things known as earthquakes here. But I have to tell you, I have no idea what's coming in. You never do. Never. Oh, never. No, it's always every, one show to the next. I wish for certain things the night before, I can promise you that. <laughs> and I probably could wish for them for decades, by the way, which I did for two decades. I waited for something to come in did it? that finally came in in Newport, Rhode Island. Oh, and what was it? It was a piece of Tiffany lava glass. Very rare, very special, very esoteric. And some people have told me it was a little ugly. Wow. But it was at the top of the collecting heap for Tiffany glass collectors. This practically stopped my heart <laughs> when I saw it in the box. This is the piece I was waiting for for 20 years. Oh, wow. And it's extremely special. It is meant to look like molten lava on the surface of the vase. An example like this in a retail shop could sell between $100,000 and $150,000. Where's my brother? <laughs> wow. So you take the items that you think are worthy to be on the show and you go and pitch it. Exactly, and not in front of the guest. And usually when a guest brings me something and I think it's TV worthy, I don't tell them anything about it. I just say, you know, this is kind of interesting. Um, I'd like to pitch it for TV. Do you have a few hours? Because it might take a while. The process can be long. Um, would you be interested in going on TV? And um, most people say yes. The poker face is for the person who owns it? Absolutely. Okay, oh, no, no, you have no idea what happens when, when, when I pitch it to Marcia. You're like, guess what I got? Like, I have to go, I have to be hidden because sometimes it's called jumping up and down. Uh, no, there are times, or, or one, as I said one time, um, when the piece came in in Rhode Island, and I had to go over to the, the uh, volunteer who was wearing the headset for, to call over the producer, I said, tell them that Arlie has found the holy grail. <laughs> I love that. I was just, you know, and, and, and then I went very calmly back to my seat. And I said, uh, the producer will be over in a little while. Uh, let, me, let me seat you over here. And the other thing that we do, and this is very important, all of the appraisers tell the guests to cover up their items. Oh. Because sometimes we have people who also want to be appraisers who are not appraisers, and they'll go, oh, that's a piece of Tiffany. Oh, you know, okay. and then it spoils it. That's interesting. So once you've found that item that you know you want to be on the show it's it's pause we're gonna do this and we're gonna unveil it real which is real TV exactly that's fast show me your poker face oh that's good show me your holy grail face <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Actually, it's really important, too, that you get excited when you're pitching something, because if you're not excited when you're pitching something and you go, well, I guess I could go on TV with this, you're not going to go on TV, I can tell you that. What are the, the signs that you know you're on to something valuable? 
Uh, usually I recognize it immediately. That, that's, the, that's the beginning. Uh, but also, it's, in, it's always interesting to listen to the guest stories uh, because information gets handed down from generation to generation and sometimes it gets enhanced. <laughs> and ultimately what we do as appraisers is we just look at the object. How are you? I'm good, how are you? How did you get the piece? Um, I befriended a little old neighbor lady back in the 70s and she gave it yeah. to me. It's what we call Bristol glass. Bristol? Yes. So it, in its condition, probably worth about $75. You do all of this, in fact, all of the appraisers do, for free. That's true. In fact, flight, expenses and all, you do all of that. We do, absolutely. And, and you know, it's a great way to give back to public television. I really feel good about it. Uh, and, and plus, you know, our mission is to educate people. That's what public television does. And we're here to do that. And it feels good to do that. And that's one of the reasons why we all participate. Oh, I love that. Well, then let's end on a good note. OK. Thank you so You're much. Very welcome. What a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. you. And that was good lovely. luck with all the appraisals here. Thank you. I hope there are lots of them. <laughs>I'm Michael Sanford. It's been a pleasure being part of your Sunday. We hope you've enjoyed today's stories and that you'll be back next time for another episode of Sunday Stories. Until then, have a great week.